All right, we're going to talk a little about a new scalar model of physics. And here's the abstract, and I'll just read this for you because you probably can't read it from where you are. But this is really the heart of the matter. The quest of modern physics has been to develop a model which correctly describes the role and dynamics of the interactions by which nature works. In order for the model which describes these interactions to be robust, it must not only accommodate phenomena which are known to occur, but must also accommodate all rigorously documented phenomena. Predict phenomena which are as yet undiscovered and allow for the inclusion of all rigorously observed, impeccably documented, carefully reported data derived from all valid sources. To be adequate, any universally applicable physical model must also accommodate the contemporaneous interaction between Descartes' physical stuff and what he referred to as spirit stuff with equal cogency and grace. The physical model, as we've inherited it, this legacy from Descartes, really cuts the universe in half. It arbitrarily separates anything that cannot be seen or measured directly as spirit stuff, which remained the sole and undisputed territory of the Catholic Church. At their request. Yes. At their request as a, as a okay, deal the they made. Because yeah. they were still suffering the from their, from their um, the repercussions of Copernicus and Galileo at yeah. the time. And, I mean, they were aware that the doctrinal discord between what they said was going on and what the science really demonstrated was going on was, was so indisputably clear that they couldn't argue about it. So they just decided to pick their own battlefield and claim all the unseen spirit stuff as the sole province of the church. And Descartes didn't disagree with that because he didn't think there was anything to it anyway. So he gave that up, Descartes and his gentlemen friends, wealthy landed royal gentry, who are the only ones who could afford to do this naturalist observation stuff in the first place, everybody else working for a living, trying to survive. Descartes and his, and his rich buddies went out and did science. And that deal remains very much intact today. In fact, our legacy is so strongly embedded in the way our culture operates that anybody who is who pretends to be a serious credentialed scientist who embarks on uh, a journey intended to rigorously inspect, report, and validate on the unseen spirit stuff, the stuff of mind and consciousness and scalar interactions, non-local field effects, holographic coupling, all of those kinds of things outside the mainstream of science runs the risk of being stripped of their credentials and ostracized from the scientific community. Many of the errors in the standard model have been the subject of remediation attempts. A lot of really smart people have worked very hard to fix the errors. One of those Brian's personally familiar with, and that is that back in the mid to late 90s, a team of 18 mathematicians and scientists got together uh, with Tom Bearden, um, Myron Evans, Larry Crowell, Donnie Reed, a bunch of very, very competent, smart people, and they rewrote Maxwell's electrodynamic equations. Well, why the hell they do that? Well, electrodynamic equations, 1854, constitute the basis of everything we do with electrodynamics. But in the original equations, which were called quaternions, there were four simultaneous unknown variables, one of which was time. And it would take, you know, a hundred mathematicians ten years to solve one of those equations working with pencils and paper. I mean, it's just very serious stuff. So, in, in 1905, um, Cedric Lorenz, a Hungarian mathematician, came along and imposed what is called the Lorenz uh, transform. Yeah. The Lorenz transform. What the Lorenz transform does is it takes mathematics and it eliminates the delta t. 
that's gone from the equation. Okay? Now you have just three dimensions. Okay? So now you have only three variables to work with, and then it begins to eliminate any consideration of the underlying stressors, tensors, vectors. The analogy I like to use is that it did to mathematics what is equivalent to taking a big, long, powerful river, covering it with ice, and then claiming that what you see is all there is, that the river is not under there anymore. Because they did that, it simplified electrodynamics and it gave them a way to design motors and generators and rectifiers and all the electrical equipment. But the reason the electrical equipment doesn't work with anywhere near the right kind of efficiency is because they left the other stuff out. So today, in any PhD program in electrodynamics in any university in the world, not one of the equations that Maxwell derived is in the textbook. Not one. And none of the text formulas were part of his original formulations. They've all been altered. All. So what the Union of Distinguished Scientists did was rewrite all these pieces, 60 different papers, they put it into one volume, and it's called Reformulation of Maxwell's Electrodynamic Equations. And I have one of those. And if you want a copy, I'll make a copy and send it to you. I mean, they're right on the money. They corrected 23 fundamental errors in electrodynamic formulation. In addition to that, Ruggiero Santilli rewrote the laws of hadronic mechanics, what goes on with neutrons and protons and electrons and neutrinos and all 26 of the hadronic particles. He wrote a brand new model for that. And we use it. It works. It's wonderful. A guy named Mahmoud Malehi reformulated the laws of thermodynamics. And his reformulation of the laws of thermodynamics fundamentally alters how you talk about the second, the second law of thermodynamics, the conservation of mass and energy. Fundamentally rewrites that rule. Because many of the technologies we're talking about are related to things that go on in electrodynamic equations that violate the way the, the second law of thermodynamics is written. It's wrong. It doesn't mean there isn't a conservation, but the way it's characterized is wrong. Okay? And then, in 2008, you wouldn't believe it, the United States Patent and Trademark Office issued a patent to Ted McGrath, a physics professor at the University of Miami. It's called Physical Quantum Model for the Atom. They issued a patent on the way he describes the quantum relationships and dynamics that operate in the atom. And he's right on the money. What you're going to see here is exactly what's in his patent. It was an unanticipated third-party validation of our model three years after we published. So we know we're right on the right track.